Welcome to the Great Beer State podcast from the Michigan Brewers Guild. The Great Beer State is a weekly show sharing conversations and stories from the passionate people who contribute to our vibrant Michigan beer community. It is made up of a mix between full-length archived interviews from the Guild's first documentary book project, A Rising Tide, Stories from the Michigan Brewers Guild, and conversations recorded in the here and now. Each episode is kicked off with a conversational update from host Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Guild, and the Brevangelist Fred Biltman, author of A Rising Tide. Here's Scott and Fred. Welcome to episode six. Scott, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Fred. Cheers. Yeah, episode six already. Cheers to that. Cheers to that. So we're moving right along. We are going to share uh, another interview from the archives. This was uh, one of the interviews for A Rising Tide, the book project. And this is with Larry Bell, founder of Bell's Brewery, uh, recorded at the Eccentric Cafe, their tasting room in, I think it was, uh, might have been early October of 2018 or late September, something like that. So that's what's on the docket for today, besides our uh, usual updates and conversation. Um, so we'll get to more about Larry and that conversation in a bit, but um, love to kick it off to or hand it off to you we've got new backgrounds this week so there's there's some sort of update there tell us about uh what's going on brewery members and uh july well july is michigan beer month and this is something that we've had reaffirmed by the state legislature every year for many years now uh i think we've always always had a vision of a, a big celebration of Michigan beer in July, culminating with the Summer Beer Festival. And I'd be the first to admit that we haven't done a great job of making it a big celebration. But in the absence of a Summer Beer Festival this year, due to the COVID situation, um, we're focusing a little more attention on what we can do to celebrate July as Michigan Beer Month, encourage members, of course, to go out and support their local breweries and we're working on organizing a a toast um, probably the Thursday evening before when the festival would be um, so more more news on uh, specific details on that but rather than try and coordinate a lengthy event we thought it might be fun to have a big toast and not do it on the weekend but a weekday evening sounds good and um, how we've been celebrating July is Michigan Beer Month for a long time. Uh, I don't know when our first proclamation was, but uh, I know it was several years after getting started. So, um, you know, that's just something interesting too, is that we were kind of uh, on this wave and really bringing a lot of focus to the Summer Beer Festival and a great time to pay attention to who's making beer right around you. Yeah. And I think as we've talked about in a couple of these other episodes, you know, it sort of started in a time where it was more likely you'd run into people that didn't know beer was made in Michigan. Uh, even though we were well on our way and had a pretty robust industry, we were still convinced in the public that it, that we were a beer producing state and that it happened near you somewhere. So uh, kudos to everybody that's been behind bringing that awareness forward and July is a great time to really celebrate it. Yeah, it's an interesting tie-in with uh, with today's feature. Uh, there's some conversation about that. Yeah. Not specifically beer month, but um, just trying to generate awareness and let people know that breweries are a thing. They're not a joke. That's right. So any other brewery updates? Last week we talked about self-distribution, uh, the cap being raised, and... Uh, legislation being passed uh, in, in a way that was uh, exciting and supportive of uh, small brewers. Uh, anything else going on this week? Anything new? For That's still what's on people? my mind. Uh, we're, we're expecting the governor's signature any day, but uh, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's pretty big news for us. It sounds like a minor thing, but having that self-distribution cap raised um, 
is a big deal for some breweries, maybe not for any, but in general, it's um, it it's an achievement that shouldn't be taken for granted. Uh, these some of these legislative changes can be difficult and time consuming. So, really happy to see that that get done. Um, we've had some brand registration issues. Uh, breweries are certainly aware of the need to register their brands and we've clarified and simplified that process um, within this package of bills as well as streamlined a couple festival things um, so anyway it's it's exciting stuff anytime that we can get uh, even a, a minor change made legislatively to help the industry out absolutely and again it's a sign of sort of changing times, I think, getting any attention at all and getting something out of committee and getting something moved. In a, and now we're in a particularly difficult climate. So to have them pay attention to our issues and execute and get it done is, is really a, a great thing compared to the old days. So great work uh, to you and everybody else that worked on that. Um, next up, we, we generally talk yeah. about enthusiast updates, and I thought besides talking about that and celebrating that this is our first live stream um, introduction, episode introduction for enthusiasts and other members, uh, we were talking ahead of this about allied members and in general, maybe this is also a good opportunity to share what are the different membership types, and maybe we can give a little shout out to allied as well as enthusiasts. Who are they for listeners and, and uh, how does that work within the organization? Sure, well, we have three membership types. The primary membership are our voting members and those are the brewery members of the Michigan Brewers Guild. We've got about 300 of them. And we have two other classes of membership. We have what we call enthusiast membership and allied membership. And the enthusiasts, of course, are the individuals who have been supportive for a long time or a little time, um, but these are individual memberships that get you a little bit of swag uh, and other benefits like an invitation to view this uh, this introduction recording. And a one that's, that's really popular is the ability to get into our beer festivals uh, an hour before the general public. So that's a great benefit. There are often uh, special beers tapped during that time that you might not get if you uh, enter at the general admission. Um, our allied yeah. members are a really important class of membership. These are businesses that provide goods and services to the brewing industry. Their support is vital to us having things like our annual conference and their support in general makes a lot of what we do possible. And these are, these are everything from distributors like Rave Associates and Alliance Beverage Distributors to malt suppliers, hop suppliers, uh, providers of services, anything from in insurance to legal services um, and, and lots of other things that are provided to brewery members. So these are folks that identify our industry as a, a target industry and our members as potential or existing consumers. And it's important that that we that we show our appreciation and hopefully it's a resource for a brewery that's getting into business to to look at our website and find suppliers that have expertise in our area and i hope that our members use it as well uh, the, these allied members are listed on our website you can search them by the goods or services they provide and it's really a, a great resource of folks who are experienced with our particular needs yeah, and there's a great amount of um, networking and education and mentoring, advice, you name it, uh, in that collective network. So it's not, you know, that's one of the things I love and what I learned through my years is that that supplier network and the distribution network, both directions, uh, there's there's just so much information sharing and help and um they're valuable resources, which is great. And them being members and supporting us really just strengthens that conduit and, and um, connection uh, from members, basically from brewers to the people um, providing expertise, equipment, and supplies. So I yeah, also want to... I can't tell you how many times I've, I've learned from you. You talk to a label supplier 
and they know so much about labels and getting that label on your bottle or you know a, a supplier of, uh, of of bottles or cans and they can help you with so many of you, the hiccups that you might run into in operations they're experts in a particular field um, and brewers need to learn to have some level of expertise in lots of fields so their their resources are very very valuable yeah, and Shannon brought up last week another great point about the enthusiast membership is that we generally talk about that VIP lane as early entry, but in addition to being early entry, it's also the VIP entrance to the festival all day long. So whether you use that hour or not, when yes. you come in, you're fast-tracked through the VIP entrance with a smile and a either non-existent or very short line compared to the lines that might wrap around the block. So that's uh, a yeah, benefit and the, that the key, a lot of enthusiasts. The key point there is if you, yeah, if you're an enthusiast member, you're not likely to just march by the whole line if you don't realize that there is a VIP line for you. Mm-hmm. So even if you're not there that early, you're welcome to march up, up to the front of the line and, and take advantage of your membership benefit. Absolutely. That can be, uh, that can be essential. And once we get back to festing, uh, the way we love to, that'll be, uh, that'll be a valuable treat. Uh, what else? I, any other way we should be encouraging the public to, uh, engage with July as Michigan beer month or in general, we've been promoting the be kind to your reopening, uh, on-premise establishments and breweries and any other retailers. Uh, any other news or things that people can do for, for July? I, I think the main thing is to look for beer at retail. Uh, if, if it's a big sales month for folks at the major chains um, or at uh, independent stores or, or bars and restaurants, it just helps the cause. So Think about your lo- local brewery. Think about July and think about being thirsty and drinking Michigan beer. Um, I, I, I will say we have been harping on the, the be kind message for guests, you know, folks who are attending um, bars, restaurants, breweries. I, I, I continue to talk to people who are getting open and they're challenged in so many ways, labor, food supply. And one of the challenges is is ornery guests and it, it it's really troublesome and difficult so i think most of us are pretty thoughtful um but i'd like to beat that drum again that a little bit of patience goes a long way yeah i don't think we can say it enough i'm seeing a lot of uh conversation from you know our friends our networks are all people in this in this business of serving guests and and they're all I, I can sense that they're all a little worn out and beleaguered and, and, um, and so they need our support and they need our compassion and mostly, you know, they need some softness when we're coming in versus, uh, anything else. So it seems like it's common sense, but I think, uh, everybody is a difficult time for everybody. So people are on edge too and can lose their patience because we've all about had it. So, uh, that's a great message to repeat every week, and I uh, hope everybody can can hear it. Um, that leaves us to, uh, prior to the introduction of the interview itself, we've got the Brewers Dozen. So we're going to give a shout out to 13 brewers across the state. Uh, we talk about this every week, that it's sort of uh, the member roles are so large and diverse and impressive that uh, this is a way we can give every brewery that's a member of the Michigan Brewers Guild a shout out throughout the course of the season. Scott, you want to kick us off? Yeah, let's start with Alpha Michigan Brewing Company in Alpha, Michigan. Um, this is in the kind of in the far reaches of the Upper Peninsula on the western end of the UP, and they're a relatively new brewery. I bet many many folks haven't been there yet, so plan a trip. Right on. Excellent. I get Big Heart Brewing Company in Heart, Michigan. So uh, I've got a lot of relationships up there. Worked with Phil a long time. Um, Been open a few years and doing a great job. Uh, It's a great place to visit. 
and uh, doing a great job with both beer and food and hospitality in general. Brass Ring Brewing Company in Grand Rapids is, uh, they've been open a couple years. They're a, a fun neighborhood brewery. Uh, had a nice visit there when I met those folks when they were getting open. Uh, part of the part of the vast community in the Grand Rapids area in Beer City. Right on. We've got Clam Lake Beer Company in Cadillac. Cadillac's a great, I kind of consider it like... Yeah, Clam Lake is... Uh, yeah, sorry to jump in on you there, Fred, but they're... Uh, their brew pub and they've got a, a a great selection of guest beers in addition to their their own house brewed beers so it it was great to see something kind of get in that part of the state in in the Cadillac area right downtown yeah i agree and what i was saying is uh, especially before the highway changed i always considered Cadillac kind of the clutch between uh southern and northern lower michigan it's like the spot to you know, get out of the car for a minute, stretch your legs, get a bite, get a get a drink. Um, and I've covered that that path many, many times. So um, it was great to great to see them open there. You're up next. Yeah, we got our longtime members and friends at Coonan Brewing Company, their original original location in Warren, and of course they've got a really a fabulous loca second location in Clinton Township. Excellent. And Middle Coast Brewing Company in Traverse City. So I have not been there yet. I did enjoy, um, you know, we heard Jack uh, Archibald talk about the, the growth of breweries in Traverse City. So here we are, uh, another new brewery in Traverse City. Um, but I haven't been there yet. Yeah, in Middle Yep, Middle Coast, for those of you who may not recognize the name, they, they started under the handle of Monkey Fist and have migrated. So I, I hope they don't mind me mentioning that, but it might help make a connection with some of those folks who already know them and are wondering what that is. Right but, on. Uh, East West Brewing, another Grand Rapids brewery, another very unique operation. It's a uh, uh, an Indian cuisine restaurant with the brewery added on, and it's it's not just a, a tiny brewery; it's a a real brewery, and uh, it it's a unique combination, and a, another unique spot in the Beer City area. Right now, we've got another longtime member and participant uh, in our scene, uh, Griffin Claw Brewing Company in Birmingham, and then GCBC think tank in Rochester Hills. Yeah, Griffin Claw opened the second kind of production facility location in Rochester Hills that they call the think tank. Um, Oddside Ales in Grand Haven. Again, Oddsides has been around for quite a while. They've got a really cool pub in the downtown area uh, in Grand Haven. It's uh, in the, the site is an old piano factory. And then they've got their production facility outside of town, but they've they've uh, they've sat there and just grown steadily and distribute their beers and have a vibrant pub uh, in their their little uh, beach town in Grand Haven. Right on, Redwood Brewing Company in Flint, another long-standing member, been making a lot of great beer for a long time, and it's really a great story for Flint. Uh, which has had a, a lot of different stories and a lot of different challenges over the years, but Redwood's been cranking beer out for the duration. Another longtime member, Sherwood Brewing Company in Shelby Township. They've got uh, a rock solid operation there that's that seems to really consistently appeal to their local community, and they've been big supporters of the Guild for a long time, so Shout out to Ray and Lisa and the crew at Sherwood. Yes, and we have Tantric Brewing Company in Allegan, Michigan. That's in my neck of the woods. Um, and they're doing a nice job. They've got a great tasting room there. Uh, Allegan has a couple of breweries now, which is amazing. And um, they're uh, just doing great stuff. I think, I don't know if you know, they're probably in their second year or maybe just past it. Um, but it's great to see that, them bringing, bringing that, stuff to Allegan. 
Yeah, that's that's about right. About two years, so it's a, a another fun neighborhood brewery. Uh, and also in your neighborhood is Waypost Brewing Company in Fenville. I guess that's even more than in your neighborhood. It's in your backyard. That is in the backyard. I would call that my uh, hometown brewery. Uh, if I had one, and uh, they took over a historic farm. Uh, fruit farm, blueberry farm, among other things, uh, and farm market. So it's a really unique location, a uh, great place to have a beer, um, and uh, love to see it here. Uh, and I've gotten to know them pretty well, and um, everybody should check it out. Uh, Waypost Brewing in Fenville. So that's 13 um, brewery shout outs for the Brewers Dozen. So next up, we're, we're getting close to handing it off to Larry uh, for the interview uh, this week. Uh, most people know Larry by name, if not uh, otherwise. Um, really the longest, I think he would be, they would, Bells would be the longest standing brewery in Michigan at this point. Um, because uh, Frankenmuth was, existed prior, but hasn't been continuous. Um, so anyways, opened in um, 85, and uh, I thought it was a pretty interesting interview to hear the stories and some of the climate and, and the perspective uh, from somebody who's, who's seen a little bit of it all. Yeah, it's a really interesting and, and great interview to, to hear Larry talk about the early days um, and have his perspective. Uh, I started going there. I was living in Kalamazoo, um, going to college when he opened. So it certainly was, it is an early memory of mine. And I remember going there when it was just kind of a little tasting room with his little kettle and it was very much a neighborhood place. And they've grown to be a, a great brewery in Michigan. They make a lot of great beers and so they've got just some of the best staff people that that you could imagine um so we're we're lucky to have um operations like that be part of our state i think they've they've helped raise the standard of all brewing in michigan absolutely and uh many people may know but not all so i'll kind of make my own disclosure so uh a big part of my career was spent at bells in those I guess for Bells, it was the middle days, uh, 1995 to 2004. So it was a very uh, formative time for the brewery. Uh, you know, started small. I, I've always described it as sort of the duct tape brewery days and then expanded to Comstack during that time. Um, so it's definitely something that I recall, and I thought that was an interesting component of the interview too because – you know, we were talking about stories that a lot of stuff he and I uh, went through kind of side by side. So um, it was interesting to conduct the interview and then also very interesting to listen back. And, um, but I thought he shared a lot of interesting perspective. So I also thought that um, I liked how he spoke to it and it really was also accentuating I think a message you and I've shared about why why we did the Rising Tide project is to try and help newer younger industry members understand the context of what what's being built and and I think that um I just think there's some stuff there's some good things to hear in this interview about that because I didn't feel it was preachy I think we all but going to the Rising Tide project not just Larry's comments, but our goal was to not be preachy and talk about, listen, you got to toe the line. It was more like we want to help our community understand the context of where we've come from so that we can collectively grow where we're going. And that's part of storytelling. That's part of, of you know, being open for new ideas and new business uh, businesses to come in and also being respectful of, well, where have we gone and where have we already bumped our head and um, what sort of change collectively is going to be good for the industry? That's a change. It's a fluid changing answer all the time. But if we don't 
pay attention to all of those perspectives, we'll, we'll have a harder time being together. I thought some of that came out in this conversation. Yeah, it really did. And, you know, speaking of context, one of the things that that's mentioned is, you know, you, you couldn't always go to a brewery and buy a couple of pints. You could get some limited free samples, um, yeah. get your beer to go, but uh, they didn't have all of this opportunity to socialize and have different experiences. So it, your point about context is right on. Yeah. So I think unless you got anything to add there, we'll, we'll hand it off um, to Larry uh, from Kalamazoo talking about, you know, the early days of the mid eighties uh, and all points in between uh, up until now talking about the great beer state of Michigan. Here's Larry. Cheers to that. Cheers. Maybe you could start with just the story of how you got into brewing at all in the first place, the thumbnail sketch of uh, Larry starting to brew. Um, so, yeah, I started home brewing in 1980 uh, here in Kalamazoo. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I wind up uh, moving over to Ann Arbor for a little bit, I think at the beginning of 82, which is right when Real Ale opened i believe or somewhere right in there yeah we talked to ted by the way it was a yeah. great, great story um you know and certainly i was aware of well of course anchor and then sierra nevada and you know started seeing this stuff and um i actually have the letter a copy of the letter that the uh, government so I'd written to the federal government saying, what do I have to do to open a brewery? And they write back, I think it's September of 82 that they're writing to me and I'm starting to think about uh, where I can go there. So, you know, I was home brewing and then I took a class with Bill Newman uh, up in Albany, New York. And Bill was given a class on uh, small commercial brewery operations. Um, you well, know, it's early. Um, I think there were 40 people who took the class, two of which actually opened breweries, myself mm. and Mark Stutrud at Summit. Oh, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I opened the homebrew store in 83 um, and selling stock and then doing experimental brewing for CalSec uh, with their hop products and getting their backing. And so then we opened. The brewery opens in September of 85 with the 15 gallon soup pot. Uh, initial, there was $32,000 in stock and a $7,000 loan from the bank. Wow. And so that had to be kind of wild. Like how did your small operation provide, you must have provided either scale or, or perspective or testing ground that, that what was your value to CalSec in terms of were you providing an environment and a size that they didn't they didn't have or an experience? <clears throat> CalSec was trying to work with Boots the Chemist in England uh, who sold homebrew kits and they were working on a little hop oil packet. Mm -hmm. So I, I would make a control batch and then a batch dosed with, with their hop oil. Uh, because this is exactly what they were trying to do is, is put this into homebrew kits and, yeah. and build that business. And so we'd go out and do tastings out there, but then I would, I would bring along some of my beers as well and sort of had a taste panel going there yeah. and I could get feedback on the beers that I was doing. Yeah, that's pretty good for both sides. They need a home brewer. Yeah. You, you need a little, yeah. you need some customers <laughs> uh, and projects. Um, so... You got the brewery open then uh, a little while later, and um, you know it's a long time where. Uh, so if, and also correct me on the timing or inform me on the timing. So I believe Real Ale closed prior to you yep. opening the brewery. Yes, absolutely, uh, and uh, Stroh's closed as well. Although they still had their uh, research laboratory in uh, downtown Detroit. Yeah, but they're closed. Uh, Geyer Brothers and Heilemann are still open in the state, in up in Frankenmuth. Yeah. So that had to be just an interesting looking terrain in terms of there's enough of there's enough 
movement happening that, like you mentioned, the California examples of Anchor and Sierra are, are starting to roll, and there's people teaching a commercial brewing class. So there's got to be at least some pulse to the idea that this is coming. But on the other hand, you're looking at a state where the only other example that was near what you're doing closed, and there's only a couple of other commercial breweries at all that are a completely different scale. Like, what? Well, how did you sort of bolster yourself in the face of that horizon? Well, you know, I went and visited some of these old regional breweries and talked to them, and pretty much they all sort of said the same thing. They said, if you can get yourself to 30,000 barrels, just stay there. You have a nice family business, stay off the radar of the big guys, and you can make your beer and, and it'll be fine. And I think that there might be some truth to that. Um, in their day, uh, it was 30,000 barrels. And there, I mean, there's still one or two that still do that. Um, Straubs comes to mind. But, um, you know, the guys that failed, the breweries that failed, were all the ones that were trying to chase a bigger number, trying to compete against the big guy. And in the end, they couldn't. People hung on who said, you know, it's okay to have, have a nice nice business. They may, they didn't innovate, which was their problem. But, you know, what if that number today is 500,000 barrels or 700,000 barrels? Yeah. You know, the chase for bigness sometimes is chase down a rabbit hole you don't want to go. Right. But, and also that, that them, those regional breweries describing 30,000 barrels, like it's a, like it's a low under the radar number is gigantic to a, a grown up home brewer going, wow, it's going to be a while before I have to worry about 30,000 well, barrels. Well, you, you know, the whole, the whole thing was, um, was really at that point was just to try and develop some product and market for the product and then go get yeah. real financing uh, at some point and get, get some real equipment, um, which was, you know, that was just the struggle for years and years and, and years down, down the line to yeah. b before we, uh, you know, really were secure with, uh, bank financing. And I mean, even, you know, when we went to build the new brewery oh, yeah. out in, uh, in Comstock and the president of the bank got fired and I was going to see a bankruptcy attorney and not sleeping at nights. Yeah. Um, things were a little wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so let's back up a little bit and, and talk about, so in those early years of the brewery, um, I guess one, you know, there, there was some movement in terms of, um, other breweries joining the effort, but not really until the law changed. So, and I know that you were in those conversations. Can you talk a little bit about um, how that came to be and what it was that transpired that opened up the micro and brew pub licenses? I guess, um, you know, having seen the, the $2 per barrel tax break at the federal level and uh, understanding that, I went to the state, uh, I went to Mary Brown and Paul Wartner, I, again, in the archives, we just found a letter from Mary Brown uh, saying, Here, here's the law, is this, is this what you're looking for? We've writ written up a bill to introduce to give brewers a $2 break. And it took a few times to get it to take. Um, you know, the first Senate committee hearing I went to, they had me in the hallway so fast, it wasn't even funny when the, the wholesalers stood up and said, we see this as a precursor to brew pub legislation. We don't want it. It was over, but I persisted. Um, so we get the $2 per barrel tax break, which was huge because uh, that was a rebate that came at the beginning of the year. So those slow months, January, February, March. And who is that affecting in the state at the time? Everybody that's in operation, which is me, you. Me and then and then King, I guess. Um, is Detroit Mackinac on the scene yet? Uh, yeah, maybe they're. Yeah, maybe they're around. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So <laughs> very yeah. small, yeah. motley crew. <clears throat> and, and then, and then comes along uh, the, in the brew pub legislation. There was we kept upping that the uh, the threshold for where you get the tax break. And so in that brew pub legislation, 
there's also the tax part there that ups the barrelage limit for what you're getting on on the tax break. But so then, that was kind of a, a, a second movement legislatively was was kind of confirming the wholesalers concerns in a way, but something turned them around to did they support it, oppose it, but so and maybe you could explain so what well, got we, written we, in ninety two. We, but we well the the reason the wholesalers supported it is because we did away with self distribution. Uh -huh. Which I started out doing self distribution, but by ninety two I had all distributors in the state. So I I no longer cared. I don't think there was anybody that really cared about self distribution. Fine, take it away from us, give us the right to sell beer by the glass. That was the deal there. Self distribution then comes back many, many years later right. as people want it again. But that's, <clears throat> the wholesalers were able to get self distribution out of there. And right. sort of because Stroh's had done that, and in case anybody else wanted to come in the marketplace, they get to cement what they want for three tier system. And here's a couple little guys, they're gonna sell beer by the glass. Well, I can't be anything. What's worse that could happen? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that gets signed in, in 92, yep. June 11 of 93, we become the first brewery in the state to sell beer by the glass to the public. And it is some somewhat semantics. You'll see, you know, there's another, there's a, because it, whether it's a brew pub license or a microbrewery right. license, so, so there's two of those licenses that are the first. Meaning yeah. I think Traffic Jam, tra Traffic Jam and Snug claims the first brew pub, and you're saying first micro. Yeah. And it's we, kind of the same it, language. We, we actually served beer by the glass to the public before them. So I we, see. We were the first ones to sell beer by the glass. Right, and their sentence only holds because yeah. you're not a brew pub by license. Yeah. Right. This is, I'm just clarifying right. what you meant by something. Right. We were a microbrewer. Microbrewer number one. Which. Uh, so microbrewers beat the brew pubs also. It's a second victory. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's counting. Uh, so from that point on, so June 93, uh, beer by the glass is being served by a brewer. And over the course of the next handful of years, really, as we we're talking, you need to start realizing the, the 94s that are out there in the 95s mm -hmm. and even in the UP and and all across the state. There, fire gets lit. The, there's a fire that's lit. So what did that look like, feel like from your vantage point, who had been uh, tending the frontier cabin uh, for a while by yourself? Uh, what, what was that experience like? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's it's good and bad. You have um, you have a lot of interest. So, you know, there's a lot more consumers coming to the marketplace now, wanting to get involved. Um, and but you know, you have a a lot more people getting involved on the brewing side. Some <clears throat> some qualified and some not so qualified. Some things change. Some things stay the same. Uh, you, you know, um, and. Uh, you know, and, and and of course, you know, it's somewhat hurting cats with brewers, uh, uh, people that are very individually minded, and and pulling in different directions. Um, you know, I think, but I think overall, that's good and interesting, and you know, all of a sudden, good beer is getting on the radar for for everybody uh, in the state. Uh, you know, it goes a little bit then. We get to, uh, as we move down the road a little bit, you've got people jumping in the industry that really shouldn't be in the industry. Yeah. The, the, because they, they want to come in and they want to make a quick buck. Yeah. Um, they're not really beer people. Uh, you have people that are, you know, uh, buying bad equipment, making bad beer, which hurts the industry on that side too. So, yeah. um, is there any expectation on your or anybody else's part that 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 law change would be such a quick catalyst that it would that did you expect there to be a dramatic impact on the number of licenses by that by well, that decision? I, I don't think the the number was I think the number was probably about what I expected at that time. So you went the, to like thirty by yeah, ninety, right? Six or seven and sixty by the, a couple the years impact later. is the impact is now. Yeah, you know, and you got, you know, fifty new breweries opening a year in Michigan. Oh yeah, the numbers seemed laughable back then. But yeah, I still look at it like it was also a doubling. Like oh, we went from 
3 to 30 and 30 to 60, like, that's dramatic by any standard, even yeah. if it's small number. But still, it's a big state. And, yeah. you know, it's, so, okay, it, we got 30 at, 60, at 60, you still knew everybody. Yeah, yeah. At 400? Uh, yeah. I'm with Sorry. You. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost it. Yeah. And so, um, so out of that then grew this, like you said, uh, you start to know everybody. And I can remember those years uh, in 95 anyways and starting to hear about different things from across the state. And then do you recall your first guild memory of when uh, the guild started to be I, a seed? I think it's really uh, uh, Rex Halfpenny and... Um, Rex kind of seen everybody and talked to everybody because he's putting out the beer guide. So he's one guy that's pretty, every two months, he's pretty much talking to everybody in the state. And, um, you know, of course you were involved in this as well. Uh, I think, you know, I think it was your suggestion that uh, we go to a neutral <laughs> zone. I think Rex wanted to have it at Bells or something. Yeah. No, 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 we, we can't go to anybody's brewery. You know, because they're going to, somebody's going to think you want more than uh, yeah, somebody Yeah, we were else. joking about it. I was like, you know, it seems either sage or petty. Uh, go back and forth, depending on but, um, how you look at it. You know, <laughs> well, that's uh, true. It, it, you know, and I think there, there's still the, uh, you know, we get everybody together. Um, issues that were, that were there at the dawn of the Guild are probably still with us today when it comes to, you know, and all the things that, that happen with um, beer by the glass. You know, are you a retailer? Are you a manufacturer? Uh, do you want loosened laws for retailers? Or do you want retailers, you know, breweries to have to be more manufacturers yeah. in the state? And this is, I mean, this is something we, it's been fought in the three tier system for so long in the mm -hmm. United States. So, you know, I, I think all that's that's still there. And I think that was there at the at the dawn of the guild. And there were discussions at that point. And, you know, at that point, my position was, we better not make the hearing all of that. So to get everybody together, we better not be political. Because mm -hmm. if we're political right now, we're gonna we're not split together. apart. Because you, you want more brew pubs and, you know we're we're selling to to the restaurants, and you know, and that held for for many years. Not being uh, political, obviously that 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 has changed. Um, but just to talk about being marketing, you know, yep. let's market Michigan. Let's float everybody <clears throat> everybody's boat up together. Yeah, and even the awareness piece of, you know, we were joking earlier that I don't think people even knew beer was made by people. It was just beer that arrived m magically and like the idea of people understanding that there were breweries and that there were breweries in Michigan um, w was a was a necessary education point uh, for our community at the time. Yeah, and you know, education continues and that's, you know, to do the education and, uh, you know, and, and having beer by the glass, the people actually get to come to a brewery and see the brewery and touch it and understand its culture and, um, you know, hey, look, there goes, there, there goes Joe Short. You know, yeah. his name's on this. That's pretty. I get to say hi to him. That's pretty cool. People, mm -hmm. people love that, right? Um, you know, that helps. Um, and then certainly the uh, the Guild Festival. You know, especially the Summer Festival, um, putting that together. Um, you know, I I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever um, be able to bottle that up again like it was in the in the in the early days. You know, there's so many festivals now. I I feel the like today like they're starting to get to be a little festival fatigue. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a nice long run where you know beer was just uh, so hot, and those festivals were were just magic, right? And people got to come out. Um, they're learning a ton at each festival. They're trying all kinds of things they've never got to try before. Um, uh, I think in a way that was exciting to consumer consumers uh, because it was also new that, that we can't provide that anymore. 
you know, it's yeah, we've done yeah, we've done so much. Yeah, maybe we got a new variant or something. You know, yeah. that's cool, but but not just that that whole awakening of beer that was happening at that time. Yeah, it was something else. And so you were on the inaugural board um, and the inaugural president of the guild. Can you remember? Can you describe kind of the climate of like? I mean, I believe, as I recall, you know, our, our the main thing we got out of the first meeting was that we wanted to become an organization and that the festival accomplished both of our needs, which was promoting beer and raising money. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of like that was our that was our main uh, target as an organization was to get legal and to get a festival. Can you kind of remember the climate of what it was like to go through that or and meet and, and develop relationships with these other breweries? I think that was all pretty, uh, pretty collegial, uh, uh, I would say, uh, at that point, and um, pretty loose. Um, it was pretty, yeah, loosey-goosey as well. Um, you know, um, and, and people working hard to, to get that, that that festival on, um, and I, you know, I think um, I think that that was exciting. Uh, I think we're the first festival. What, what, it was in Greenmead uh, uh, yeah, and Livonia. Yeah, you've been studying all this. I got it. Oh yeah, I've been hearing the stories for a while, so I have an advantage, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> it was, uh, and Rex was, Rex was, and John Leonardo's were essentially running the festival. Yeah. And uh, and you know, Livonia wasn't. They hadn't gotten the memo that beer was cool yet. I think and there so was a the lot idea, of police presence. Yeah, the idea of us having beer as the showcase of this public event with public sale of hundreds of beers or whatever, it was probably 100 or something. We had about 30 breweries, I think, 20, 25 yeah. to 30 breweries pouring three, four beers apiece. That, that astounded, I mean, it was like we were, it was like we were criminal. It was, we, it yeah. was like prohibition existed there. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, and we were already- Somehow we soldiered on. We were already pretty good veterans of Great American Beer Festival yeah. and Great Taste of the Midwest, yeah. and we've seen all this. Like, yeah, we're going to go. Oh, and beer. we were trying to draw so many things from Great Taste of the Midwest. Our, that were know, illegal in all Michigan. All of our favorite <laughs> festivals, none of them were illegal in Michigan. I, we kept bumping up against all this. Well, why they do that over there? You can't do that here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's that turned out to be a great thing for for Michigan, that, that festival. Um, when you think about it, you know, obviously Great Taste of the Midwest and Madison's a great festival, but then Michigan Brewers Guild Festival. When you think about great uh, regional festivals, yeah. um, certainly that's, <clears throat> that's tops on, on uh, the radar for, for beer consumers. Well, and I think another thing that's interesting is that it was put together by, you know, a trade association of brewers where uh, it's different from Great Taste, which is put on by this Tasters Guild of homebrewers and industry sort of enthusiasts. This is brewers working together and and controlling the message and develop and helping using it to develop a marketplace, yeah. which I think Great Taste helped with. But this was more direct. Can, yeah, um, I was just going to kind of launch into the next era of how do you think we grew from those original sort of bottled magic festival excitement? How do you think the community grew and how did the guild grow in the next decade or so after that? Like. What was next? Now that we kind of woke some of the market up, um, how do you think we grew up in the next stages? Well, like I say, I think there's always, from that initial meeting, I think there's always been some uh, some underlying tensions as far as where people wanted to go. And it was, um, you know, it wound up being inevitable that, um, that politics gets in there. Um, because you know you have people that know their local politicians and they want the law to go this way or and that way. So um, you know I think uh, you know probably that that late '90s there, there's a little bump, right? Um, you've got some of those people who have gotten into the business who probably shouldn't have mm -hmm. um, and who don't really understand things. So you've got 
you, you've got some different players now that really aren't coming at the industry from the same place that others are. Yet those are coming because we love beer and, yeah. you know, we're really beer people that's a career and you got people that are urologists and lawyers and dentists who put together a company. Here come the urologists. Here come the urologists. Uh, you know who I'm talking about too. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so that, that changes the, uh, changes the mix up, uh, a little bit. And, um, you know, and then, you know, you have people that want to expand, um, on, on the retail side of things. Um, you have, you know, you have laws that, that wind up, uh, having to get changed or, you know, uh, we've been tweaking those laws then, yeah. uh, for but even outside of that stuff, do you feel like, I mean, as both a, as a business person, but also um, as a beer drinker and as just as a person, <clears throat> we've seen the landscape change in terms of how consumers treat beer, in terms of how, uh, b whether beer, really, we had to fight for our voice to even be considered uh, anything beyond a joke in the early days. And then, and now you see communities sort of championing beer as this, as this hallmark for and breweries as and so what did that look like to you in terms of um as as we grew up as businesses we were also seeing community and consumers change their opinion of what beer could be or what it was and what what did that look like from your vantage point well i think um you know i think one of the things that happens in michigan is our economy is terrible during this time that you're talking about. Uh, really, in general, it is not a great uh, time. Um, <clears throat> you know, different people will point fingers this way or the other, but it's just Michigan going through the change in the auto business especially, mm -hmm. and our economy is not that great. However, we got all these people that love our state and understand economics and want to support their homegrown breweries. And I, I mean, you know, cause otherwise in an economy like that, this shouldn't have happened, but it's the people of Michigan, I think that say, I'm supporting the local, the local brewery. This is cool. It's here. My money stays here. And they decide to spend their money, their hard earned money because they make a car in the state and they appreciate the work ethic or whatever. But, I'm not sure if it works in another state. I don't know if, you know, if, if you take uh, that that same kind of economy to a, another state and all, where the breweries grow. Uh, in 19, I think 1998 was our worst year in there. Uh, this was after the Dateline article, um, yep. the hit job on, on Boston beer. And uh, that was our, our worst of that era when we only grew, only grew 9%. And then we were right back at great growth. Other people are going out of business at that time, but Michigan uh, pulls together for their small breweries and, and you know, uh, you've got uh, new breweries coming on and getting popular and, and. Um, do you think that, um, do you think that having, now granted we, the, the guild I think formed in 97 and the first festival is 98, uh, if, I, if memory serves. And do you, right. do you think that as we move past that, 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 um, developing relationships and strengthening community through that. Do you think that helped uh, helped weather the storm and and um, change how we how our market grew? Well, I think I think that helps. And I'm gonna um, uh, forgive me for going here, but let um, rip. Um, you know, by that time we're old as far as the Bells is old. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're, while there was Newman's and Chess Bay and, and whatnot, all those, all those failed and we somehow managed to, to hang on. So now you've got a state that's got an older brewery, you know, and where we've been selling all over the state, you know, we're running all over the place oh, yeah. in this state, selling, selling beer, doing what we can. Um, 
So and it was and you may be sold in three to four states max at the time. Yeah, but it's but it's it's Michigan. So Michigan right. ahead of the other states in the area has got I think we have a leg up because we've got something older going on for, for craft beer. We have yeah. a little bit to to lean on. So, you know, by by ninety eight we're thirteen years old. Yeah. And people can I think that's one thing people can look and say, Look, this works after thirteen years. Yeah, yeah. You, you know. This can be a successful thing, and it also means you've had people drinking you for thirteen years. So yeah, you, you've got a little bit, you've got a strengthened chorus behind you. Yeah, we're, and a little proof of concept. You know, whereas in Chicago, those early days, say in Chicago, they ate their young. You know, uh, Golden Prairie and Legacy Lager oh, and yeah. uh, whatever that terrible one in Greek Town was. That had the riveted tanks. <laughs> um, Siebens, you know, they don't survive. So we have a culture. We kind of developed the 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 craft culture in the Midwest. I think we we were able to grab that mantle earlier, and and because of that, then we have something that people could hold on to a little bit more as yeah. it went forward. Absolutely. So <clears throat> I've over the several conversations I've been hitting finding myself kind of thinking about this idea in a few different ways, which is that, you know, you have the, the brewer, the brewing community is made up of a lot of entrepreneurs with their independent spirit and head their own way. And they start their own company in there. And some of them are serial uh, entrepreneurs in terms of yeah. once that path feels paved, it's, <laughs> you know, it doesn't feel right under their feet anymore. And they're going to go carve a new path. And so they're not always great joiners. Um, but at the same time, I think we found, um, I know you and I have both found uh, energy and inspiration at times, whether it be with the Brewers Association or the Michigan Brewers Guild or any other group we might have joined for industry um, support and, and uh, fellowship, for lack of a better word. Um, and I say that meaning that, you know, our group is a atypical, it's not likely to have the best um, joiners because we're so independently minded and I know that at times you've been um, uh, you know both in and you've been out of, of various organizations but if you were going to talk to young brewers today or young breweries let's say like breweries that have opened in the last five to ten years you're talking about okay well here's the plus and minus or the value proposition of why you should join your organizations um, what are your thoughts there with your uh, decades of experience well, I think I think um, you know if you're somebody new joining the organization, take a little time and and really understand because you don't fully understand when in 1984 when I joined the United States Brewers Association, they sent me a a packet to stick on brewer wholesaler relations. I couldn't. What? I didn't understand. What do you mean? Why, why do we concern ourselves with that? But, uh, you know, you, you have to take some time and listen to some voices and, um, you know, um, and try and understand where, where, where's the history of the industry come from. And I think that's, that's something that um, is lost on some people now. As we were talking earlier, we existed for eight years as a brewery without being able to sell beer by the glass. People forget that, right? That, well, of course you can always sell beer by the glass. Why wouldn't you? Right. You know, and you know, and of course <clears throat> different states have 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 different rules. But I think it's good to to go back and re read some of the books on the history of the brewing industry in the United States. Why did things happen the way the way they did? And try and understand if you've got that fourth generation brewer that's in your guild. Where are they coming from? You know, and. Uh, that's probably easier for somebody coming in to try and read their history. Um, you know, if you're the fourth generation guy, you know, you get some young bucks that want to come take over the world and they want to franchise. We got a model we're going to franchise. Uh, yeah. uh, and those people have to teach me, well, look, you know, here, let me tell you about hops and how things went there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and trying to trying to have have that dialogue with with other people and. Um, you know, and realize that on a legislative front, usually that's all going to be settled before you ever get to the to the committee meeting at the legislature. That's no committee 
uh, chair wants a bunch of dirty laundry and, and shouting in front of his committee. So we're probably going to work this out. So you're going to have to listen to everybody or nothing's going to happen. You're going to have the status quo. Right. So And so on that front, if I were to take that forward or paraphrase it, it's sort of like understanding history and being able to dialogue and developing relationships is is kind of the only path towards productive change because you're not going to be heard otherwise. That, yeah. That's, right? If you if you're just an independent if you're just yelling from the sidelines, it's not going to get in play. Well, depending on who's on the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> It's worked before, but um, in in general, you want in general you want to avoid that. Yeah, you want to avoid. I mean, we have we have this big suite of bills right now that's going to drop in the Michigan legislature, and that's that's all groups working together. Um, we'll see we'll see if that's uh, all clean laundry at the committee, but but mostly it's been people talking in in big group settings. Yeah, but if I were going to poke at that again in another way too, like even if you're going to be a disruptor, and and walk your own path, and and you weren't happy with the status quo, and you wanted to be a disruptor, you still you still need a pretty sharp uh, awareness of of where things are in order to make that play. Right, like you can't do that blindfolded. No, no, no. And it, so history and dialogue and relationship is still gonna yeah. is still gonna help you develop a wise strategy. Right. Right, um, and and especially these days with with so many players, not only on the brewing side, but now on the wine side, on the distilling side, on cider, as wholesalers feel more pressure with laws, um, it's it's all about th that dialogue, and you know it's and it's certainly changing. Retailers are feeling threatened by tap rooms, so where's that balance and trying to listen to everybody and. And, uh, you know, it's just like in football and baseball. Every year the rules get tweaked just a little bit. It's right. a pretty good game, but we always have to tweak it a little bit. What do you think are the elements or the principles that make up a healthy environment for brewing or a healthy environment for the um, sale and enjoyment of alcohol? Like a, what, what makes our industry, what's ideal the ideal principles for our industry to be healthy? Well, I think the three-tier system. We would not have craft brewing the way we have it in the United States without the three-tier system right now. I'm pretty pretty convinced about that. And uh, I worry about about three-tier. I, I worry uh, that, um, you know, we take a couple steps too far as far as opening up... Um, what brewers can do and from there it's an easy push for the big guys to come in and implement uh, what they do in the rest of the world where they own retail that worries me um, so you know I believe in having good strong independent um, three-tier system I think is is important and, and that balance of of uh, limiting the big guys so to speak that's if I'm paraphrasing, that's part of health because it keeps it independent. Yeah, you know, and we have to make sure that we have, you know, have that even playing field where, yeah. where, entrepreneurial, hardworking craft brewer has a chance to make it. Yeah. Otherwise, um, they'll be erased. Is sort yeah, of the, and, and you know, we have to have, um, we have to have proper funding for for regulatory oversight, and um, because. Otherwise, if, there, if there's nobody watching things, as you well know, Fred, there can be a lot of corruption in this industry. There has yeah. been for many years. And if you actually have some oversight and some people watching what's going on, that's a great help to the, to the small brewer, too, because big guys can go in and easily buy, buy off all the business. <clears throat> and how, having a healthy market with opportunities for an independent craft brewer how does that translate to the consumer what makes that a better market for the consumer well it's always been about choice being able you know to offer the consumer the choices that they want and that's that's how craft brewing comes to be because uh, the choices for consumers got to be pretty pretty lame and um, uh, it, you know the big companies because 
wasn't profitable for them to make especially brand in a small amount. They just wanted to make a few brands in very large amounts, be very efficient. So now, you know, as consumer taste changed through the 70s, people got interested in good cheese and good bread. Now they want good beer, good wine to go along with it. You can do that on a small scale. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, that's uh, where some of these trade associations come in now so that we small brewers can get access to ingredients that we need and access, access to the markets that we need to sell our products. And I think that's, I think that's the key thing right now is forget about craft beer or, you know, what you're putting in it. I think our, our, the trade association for small brewers is turning into what the old trade association was. The old BAA, mm -hmm. Brewers Association of America, was about representing small independent breweries ingredients and markets and that's what it was about nobody was nobody cared about some of these other things right but that's that's where we feel the pinch now can we get access to the shelf when when somebody's the national category captain and they're going to write a planogram and push everybody else out mm -hmm. where do we get a voice yeah and and do you agree that coming to, and coming together and being involved in these organizations is is a way to strengthen that voice and protect yeah. those protect those things that have not always been present. Yeah, and, and you know, that's, uh, you know, participating in those groups, participating uh, with the uh, with the programs that they have, that, you know, that's what we need to do. And I think uh, in many ways as craft brewers, we're under fire more than we've been since the beginning here with the big guys coming after us. So yeah. sticking together, using the independent seal, going out and telling our story is important. Yeah. So kind of wrapping up for a uh, time point of view, but it, but as you sat down, you're tell, telling me about it, you know, your your new career, maybe not brand new, but environmentalist <laughs> and, and making change in other areas. Do you feel like, uh, you know, do you draw on some of the things you've learned um, in, you know, uh, in your career in beer um, to make other societal change? Or are you drawing lessons from being an activist elsewhere and bringing that into beers? Or what does that look like in terms of how you, when you leave the beer arena? Is activism for independence something that runs through? Um, well, I think doing, doing that dialogue part and, um, uh, you know, certainly helps me as I as I kind of become elder statesman in in the beer world um, you know I it that that helps me be able to go out and dialogue with with politicians and mm -hmm. uh, people in power uh, do I want to yell from the sidelines sometimes yes <laughs> I might send a text off now and then but it all we all play nice together um, so yeah, I you know is that brewing is that's life. It's all kind of the same at this point. Yeah, I just find it interesting too that I think we were talking about with Joe earlier this morning that you know there's something about the people that end up in the craft brewing scene. They they tend to model these other other fights in other arenas that are for kind of social justice or for environmental change. It's like you find the brewery personalities are out. On, on other battlefronts saying, you know, hey, wait, wait a second, we can we can do this better, we can do that better as communities. And well, I, I don't mean, know where that comes from, but. The communities come into our bars, um, but then, you know, on the waterfront, we're talking about the waterfront, who better than us to talk about water and protecting water? And and not from a, from a we're crazy activist standpoint, but hey, this is our main ingredient why are we following this up, right? This is important. And then, I mean, it's our main ingredient, but then you just look at it and go, well, this is something that everybody in the world needs. Yeah. And, and why wouldn't you do everything in your power to, to protect it? Um, and, and now you've slipped down the rabbit hole into politics. <laughs> it's true. But on the other hand, I feel like as brewery people, we have... I know I'll speak personally that, you know, we've busted up the status quo a few times. Yeah. So I do think we get a sense of confidence that versus somebody who hasn't and somebody who's maybe walked the line uh, in their life and career. I do think there's a people in this community that believe they can make change because we have. 
Yeah. We, and we, we take yeah. a victory and we roll it into the next next yeah. battlefront. And, and there, therein, if, if you've got every brewer in the state who employs all these people and, uh, you know, somebody knows somebody who works at the brewery and right. you come together and say, we need clean water, that starts becoming a, a movement that, that people have to listen, people in power have to listen to. Yeah. And we believe we can go have that conversation because we already changed the beer scene from what it was in the 70s. Yeah. Well... So. We'll see, we just don't have as much money as the other side right No, now. well, you know, I never shy away from a <laughs> fight just because it looks hard. But anyways, thanks for everything you've done for the community and for sitting with us. And Thanks, Fred. We'll, uh, we'll keep sharing the story. All right, good. Good to see you. Thanks for listening and sharing while supporting Michigan breweries and craft beer everywhere. The Michigan Brewers Guild was formed in 1997 with its first summer beer festival taking place in July of 1998. It's now five annual festivals are dedicated exclusively to Michigan beer brewed by more than 270 member breweries. The Michigan Brewers Guild exists to promote and protect the passionate Michigan beer industry in every way possible. To learn more, visit us at mibeer.com or say hello on one of our social media pages as we love hearing from you. From coast to coast, from far and near, Let's drink Michigan beer. Mm-hmm.